whatever you do, you want to develop technical mastery. You want to be the best at what you do. You want to master it. See, part of, of, of self-motivation is you've got to find something that gives you a strong sense of competence. Well, you become known for that. You develop a reputation of being good at doing that. You set some high personal standards for yourself. You're not competing with anybody else. You're just unfolding yourself to be the best person that you could be. That you want to give the best quality service that you can give because that is a statement about who you are. The other thing that's the key to self-motivation is recognize the fact that you're going to get into some slumps recognize the fact that you're going to encounter a great deal of failure in life. It goes with the territory. But in the face of that, you want to be relentless. When you want something, you don't expect everybody to say, oh, oh, you want this? Oh, great, we want to give this to you. You're such a nice person. You're doing it for your family, aren't you? Great. No, no, life isn't like that. No, many doors will be closed in your face. Many loans that you will want. And they say, no, you don't have enough collateral. You don't have enough credit. And most people will give up. But you've got to decide that I'm going to be fearless. I refuse to be denied. And I'm going to go all out. I'm going to be relentless. I don't care how many no's I encounter. I like something Isaiah Thomas said when he's getting ready for a basketball game. He said, I'm going to either shoot us in or shoot us out but I'm not going to not do anything. And that's the way to go. You can't make a basket unless you shoot the ball. You can't hit a home run unless you take a swing at it. Most people won't even take a swing. Well, I probably won't make it anyhow. That's the conversation within. They probably won't give it to me anyhow. If you want something, you've got to be relentless. You've got to decide, I deserve this, and I'm going to have it. And you go all out to get it. That drives you. The next thing is that when you want something out of life, you've got to be willing to go into action. Don't wait around for things to be just right. Don't wait for things to be perfect. Don't wait for the ideal situation. It will never be ideal. There will always be a reason. Well, as soon as the children grow up, as soon as I pay my bills, as soon as I get my divorce, all kind, as soon as I get enough money together, a lot of people never take a chance in life. They don't want to take any chances. They want the situation to be ideal. See, that's not walking by faith. That's walking by sight. If I can see it, I'll do it. No, 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 no. That's a lot of people saying, if I can see it, I'll believe it. No, 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 no. If you believe it, you can see it. And don't be disturbed because no one else can see it. That's not unusual. That is ordinary. But because you want some different kind of results in your life, you've got to be willing to be unreasonable. If you want unreasonable results in your life, you've got to be willing to be unreasonable. Part of being unreasonable, you don't judge according to appearances. Part of being unreasonable, you can see it because you believe it. That's part of being unreasonable. Part of being unreasonable, you're like Paul who said, you must have the faith to call forth those things that be not as though they were. That's part of being unreasonable. Most people won't do that. Most people say, call me when you get it together. The other thing is that one of the keys to self-motivation that empowers you is that you want to find a cause larger than yourself. Find something that you can contribute to. Find something that you can make a difference because you can. Part of what feeds your larger vision, part of what gives you a reason for being, part of what gives you your life is being able to give something back. Say, I can't afford to give anything. You can't afford not to give. Give your time. Give your talent. There's nothing just to go over and lick envelopes. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going over there. It's part of my tithing in the universe. Once you develop that, that special sense of mission, and that's what you develop when you're part of a larger cause than yourself, it drives you. You don't need an alarm clock to get up in the morning. 
You have special power. You go places and folk will like to be around you. They will know there's something different about you. See, no one would go get on an airplane if you thought your chances of getting there to your destination were as good as your luck. And I say the reason that you will reach your destination more times than your luggage will is because the airline, and I'm glad that they do, has made it a priority to move the human beings from one point to the other safely. So I'm not really upset when my luggage doesn't show up. I'm glad they delivered me because they've made me a priority. See, they have made delivering you to your destination important. So if you want to honor your commitment, whatever you decide that you're going to do, make sure you make it important. Make sure it is priority. Keep it before you. The other thing is, whatever that you want to do, whatever you want to begin to create and beginning to manifest your greatness and, and strengthening your level of commitment, and it's, it's really exercising your will, Find something that you want to do on your goal, one action step, but make sure it stretches you, that it challenges you, but it's doable, that you can do it. This year I decided that I was going to exercise. So I started out doing just 10 setups and 10 push-ups. I know I can do that and not get upset about it. I can do that without thinking. So I started out small, now I'm up to 50, but if I try to do 50 starting out, I wouldn't still be doing it. So I started doing it in, in manageable segments. Do that. And that, that strengthens your will. So my commitment now is strengthened and fortified by the activity of actually doing it. So now I can expand and build from there. When I decided to begin to manage my money differently, and I started saving 5% of my money, then I increased it to 10% then to 15%. So now I have disciplined myself to live off 75% of my income. I took discipline to do that, but I started watching how I was spending my money. I started keeping a log and following myself. So you want to begin to find something that is manageable, that you know that you can do. The next thing in beginning to, to keep your commitments to yourself have some friends that will hold you accountable, that won't let you off the hook, that won't tolerate anything less than the best from you. People that will support you in this new way of being, in this new state of consciousness. The other thing is that important is have a contingency plan. See, many times when you make a commitment to do something, there are some other variables that will happen that you can't control or you perhaps did not think about. So you want to have some other plans going on. You want to become creative. See, most people don't keep their commitments because when something goes wrong, they just stop. They don't have a contingency plan. So they don't know what to do next. Start being creative. If you challenge yourself, many times they say, I don't know what to do. And I always ask myself, but if you did know what to do less, what will it be? That activates another part of my mind. I start thinking about the possibilities and just experimenting. But many, many of us just stop dead in our tracks. I don't know what to do. You do know what to do. You've got genius in you. Challenge yourself. Push yourself. Make yourself come up with something. Use your imagination. And what you will find is that you know more than you realize that you know. That you're more creative and more resourceful than you realize that you are. And as you do that, the more you do it, the easier it will become. At first, it's going to be a struggle. And after you get into a certain level of consciousness, you will ask yourself, I, how is it that I didn't see this before? At the level that I'm managing my business now, they say consciousness is what we are. I literally look at myself and say, how is it that I didn't do this before? Why is it that I couldn't see this before? And the reason that I didn't see it before, because I didn't challenge myself. I didn't put myself out here. See, the reason that most of us go through life never discovering our true greatness, literally walking, breathing corpses, the uncommitted life isn't worth living. Why? Because it doesn't produce anything. See, you only make things happen. Your life only counts. You only make a difference when you are committed. When you make a commitment with your life. That's the people that make a commitment with their lives. The people that make a commitment to their customers. The people that make a commitment to their families, to their relationships, are the people that make the greatest impact in life. You can only have two things in life. Reasons or results. Notice, reasons don't count. 
folks will always point out reasons on why they are not living their dream, on why they are not manifesting their greatness. They will always be able to point those things out, but none of those things count. The only thing that counts are results, and results don't lie, ladies and gentlemen. They tell it all. Judge a tree by the fruit that it bears, not the ones that it might talk about, not the ones that it might wish for, or think about, or firm about, but the fruit that it actually bears. So let us look. I think that all of us are, are committed. But I think that some of us are producing results in our lives that that level of commitment brings that we particularly don't like or find distasteful. I don't think that as a participant in life, you cannot be committed. You're either committed to mediocrity or you're committed to greatness. You're either committed to being productive or you're committed to being non-productive. You're committed to being happy or you're committed to being unhappy. See, whatever you're doing, however you spend your time, that tells you who you are. So think about what it is you like to create in your life experience. Once I look at how you commit your time, once I do an evaluation on how you spend your time, I can tell you exactly what you're committed to. People that say they have dreams or want to open a business or want to do something differently than what they're now doing, they don't like their jobs, they're unhappy, they're unfulfilled. People who say they want to improve their income level, look at how they spend their time. How they spend their time, the commitment of their time, how they use that, that will really tell the truth. People who said, I'd like to do better, but you don't find them in vocational or technical schools upgrading their skills and their knowledge, how they spend their time, that will tell you what's going on. People who say they want to normalize their weight, they want to be healthy, but every time you see them, they're eating, that will tell you that they're committed to being obese for the rest of their lives. People tell you they want to stop smoking and they're lighting up at that time. Folks that say, I want to stop drinking, and every time you're in their face, they're reeking with alcohol, that will tell you what's going on don't have to listen to what they say just watch what they do commitment shows up in your life in what you do on the other hand you can make the commitment to your life that you don't like the results that you have and that you're going to do something about it see that power is available to all of us why is it that people are frightened by commitment because when you say the word commitment, that intimidates a lot of people. Why? Because it means you have to deliver. See, most people, you ask them, hey, look here, I'd like for you to do this. They'll say, I'll try. I'll try means that is my escape clause. When I don't come through, it's really a polite no. I don't have the courage to tell you no, so I'll tell you I'll try. So most people like to use that language. They don't want to commit themselves because commitment means, among many things, no excuse is acceptable. That's what it means, no excuse. That if you decided that you're gonna do this, if it becomes hard, then do it hard. If it's difficult, so what? If it's inconvenient, so what? See, a lot of people made a commitment to come here tonight, but they looked outside and said, it's raining. The temperature dropped. It's cold outside. And they decide to give up on their commitment. And that's how people do about their dreams. They don't honor their commitment to themselves. Let me tell you what happens when you, when you don't keep your commitment. Number one, it begins to deplete your, your self-esteem and it erodes your self-image. It weakens your faith in yourself. You don't feel good when you don't keep your commitments. The other thing is, that you begin to develop weak relationships with people. People begin to realize they can't depend upon you. They can't rely on you because you won't keep your word. You've established that kind of reputation. Just think, what would your life be like if you decided to keep your commitments? How much time do you spend working on you? How much time do you spend every day working on your dream? In the last 90 days, how many books have you read? In the last year, what new skill or knowledge have you acquired? What kind of investment have you made in you? So I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you want to go, if you want to make it today, and things are changing so fast you have to literally run to stand still, 
I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Here's something else. Most people are not living their dreams because of fear, ladies and gentlemen. Fear, limited vision, and lack of self-esteem is what keep most people doing things they don't want to do. The same reason that people stay in relationships where they're abused or they're unhappy or it's unfulfilling, they can't see themselves beyond that relationship. They can't see themselves enjoying life without that person. They think that this is all that they can do. The same reason that people get stuck at a certain level in life, they can't see things being better for them. And they think that this is it and this is all they deserve. This is all they've ever seen. It's been passed on to them. And they think that this is it for them. Oh no, I'm looking what Dr. Blanton, Smiley Blanton, who is a colleague of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, what he said about fear. He said, fear is the most subtle and destructive of all human diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, fear kills dreams. Fear kills hope. Fear, put people in the hospital. Fear can age you. Fear, ladies and gentlemen, can hold you back from doing something that you know within yourself that you are capable of doing, but it will paralyze you. And it seems like you're in a hypnotic spell. And I ask you a question, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of allowing fear to hold you back? What's the benefit of giving up on yourself, of not stepping out on life and taking life on? What is the benefit for you? What's the plus in that? It's one of the things I had to ask myself. So I didn't want to make any mistakes. I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to be perfect the first time I did something. It's not going to happen. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to hurt some folks' feelings. You're going to create some enemies whenever you decide that you want to begin to take life on. You've got to ask yourself, how long am I going to allow this to hold me back? I like what Zig Ziglar says. He said, fear is false evidence appearing real. That is an illusion that we create in our mind. It is a state of mind that can be changed. So let's look at how we can begin to take some steps to restructure that fear, to begin to expand our visions of ourselves, to begin to increase our self-esteem. Webster said that self-esteem means confidence and satisfaction in oneself. Look at your life right now. Whatever you've done up to this point in time, your life is working. Whatever you have produced, it came out of you as a result of the kind of person that you have become. As a result of your choices, as a result of your consciousness. Now you have to ask yourself, are you satisfied with what you have produced? Is this what you want? Would you like for things to be better than this? Do you believe that you deserve better than this? Or are you content? This is it. You don't have to do every, anything else. That you already with yourself in life and say, well, I'm happy. I'm not starving like the people in Calcutta. Are you allowing yourself to get off the hook like that? Or do you believe somewhere in the back of your mind or in your heart that there is some other great work for you to do? There's something else that has for you. And that's why you're here. How do we handle this fear factor? How do we increase our self-esteem? You have to begin to fortify yourself. How do we do that? I believe that you have to begin to consciously monitor your inner conversation and start talking to yourself. Start building yourself up. Sometimes the only good things you will hear about you are the things that you say to you. So I'm saying learn to be your own booster. Start building yourself up. Start encouraging you. Start saying, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I started thinking about becoming a speaker, I said, yes, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I start trying to convince myself I can be a businessman after flopping and failing and losing thousands of dollars and feeling stupid and dumb and having people take advantage of me because of what I didn't know. I had to talk to myself because people were saying to me that I was dumb. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I was saying, you're right, look at what I've done. I had to say, no, 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 Les. Hey, hey, come on, man, get yourself together. You can handle this. You just haven't figured it out yet. It's all right. This is your training period. This is the tuition you have to pay for what you don't know. 
You can do this. Other people have done it. It doesn't take an Einstein. Get you some people that can teach you some stuff that you don't know. Get you some people that have done it successfully and learn from them. Take some seminars, workshops, read some books on how to manage a business. Change the way you see yourself and begin to tend to the personal details. Understand that nobody's going to take care of your business better than you. And when I start changing that kind of mindset of beating myself up because of my mistakes, and start looking at the possibility of my doing better, of my making the adjustment that would enable me to do what I want to do successfully, things begin to change. And I say, stop beating up on yourself. You do do it. I know you do it. I've done it. It's a natural inclination for us to put ourselves down. See, we are born negative, I think, in a negative consciousness because we live in a negative world. Here's some other things, ladies and gentlemen. Begin to guard your mind against negative programming like turn off the television don't watch the news so you've got to guard the kinds of things that you put in your mind see if you don't program your mind your mind will be programmed because human beings are goal oriented that's why we die of broken hearts early that's why we're running through life to early graves we're going through life ladies and gentlemen and i think that henry david thoreau said that most men live in quiet desperation most of us go through life running scared so we created this in our minds, false evidence appearing real. We made it real in our minds. That's why Churchill said there's nothing to fear but fear itself. That's the destructive monster. So turn off things that can contribute to your fear. Turn a deaf ear to people that all they can do is talk about how negative things are because they have bought into the consciousness of the world. Start attending workshops, seminars, listening to tapes on a daily basis to begin to recondition your mind, to retrain your thinking. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing. Listen to things that can empower you, that can enable you to create a new reality for yourself in a new life for yourself. You might appear to be strange around most people. You know, most people think you're strange if you're happy today. See, these people have not found their purpose in life. That's why they're grumpy. That's why they're miserable. That's why they're so negative. They're hurting and they want to hurt other people. So start practicing using programs for your mind. Seminars, books, workshops. Keep a journal. Record your thoughts. What's happening with you? Every day when you get up, have a journal near you. See, ladies and gentlemen, we get three to four thoughts a year that if we would act on those thoughts, they could change our life. What idea are you sitting on? Write your ideas down. And then, once you get that idea, take the leap. Take the leap. See, it's out here in the universe. If you don't take the plunge, I guarantee you, somebody else will. Most of us go through life like that. Most of us go through life pretending. Pretending that we're satisfied where we are. Pretending that everything is okay. Pretending that, that we don't have any special goals or ambitions or desires. When really deep down inside we do really want more. But if you look at our behavior, if you judge based upon what we do, that really will tell you some true stories about people because you have to judge a tree by the fruit it bears, not the fruit that it talks about. See, a lot of people pretend that they want more out of life, but all you have to do is watch their actions. People will tell you, oh yeah, one day I want to have a restaurant. See, they're pretending they want to go into business for themselves. They're not serious. How can you tell less? Watch their actions. Watch what they're doing. The proof is in the pudding. So if you want to do something, if you thought about something you want to do, take it head on. Decide that you're going to start looking at it, start doing research on it, start tackling it, start becoming involved in whatever and wherever it might lead you to begin to explore the possibilities in that particular thing that you're seeking so that you can begin to learn all you can about it. Decide that you're going to face it, that whatever shortcomings you have, that you're going to strengthen yourself there. Whatever training that's required, that you're going to go get that training that you're going to get started right now. And George Washington Carver would say, do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied. S.B. Fuller used to say, and I heard Joe Dudley talk about, always strive to be more than that which you are. Yeah, don't get satisfied with yourself. Always know that wherever you are, you can enjoy more, that you deserve more. But most people, you know what they do? 
Most people go through life quietly and safely tiptoeing to an early grave. Find out what it is you want and go after it as if your life depends on it. Why? Because it does. People that have found their passion, people that found the things that they love, people that have found the things that they can pour their lives into, those people live longer. I was in New York and I had to do a seminar at a special church and a guy by the name of Reverend Johnny Youngblood. And I said, how is it that you were able to build this big housing facility and got all of the various community and religious groups together to, to have this dwelling for 2,000 residents that were, were once homeless? How were you able to take on this responsibility? Wasn't it overwhelming? He said, the kind of work I do, he said, it's in me. I've got to live what's in me. And I think that's everybody's desire in life. You've got to live what's in you. Life is just too short and unpredictable. But what, are, what do we say? But, but there will always be tomorrow. Oh, no. There are no guarantees you're going to show up tomorrow. There are a lot of people who were here yesterday that they're not here today. There are a lot of opportunities that were around yesterday. They're not here today. Oh, you can wait, but you know what Abraham Lincoln said? Well, good things might come to those who, to, who wait, but only the things that have been left over by those who hustle. So who want to go through life picking up leftovers? You deserve much more than that. The leftovers is somebody has left you. So take it head on, begin to explore it. Here's something else. Decide to do it now. Decide whatever you want to do, that you are now going to become actively involved right now, exploring the possibilities for you. That you're going to look at it and do just a little bit of it right now. When I decided to become a speaker, I didn't just quit my job and just ran out and say, I'm a motivational speaker. No. What I did was I decided to start looking at other people that were involved in the speaking profession. I volunteered to work with some speakers so that I could learn. Whatever you want to do, get your feet wet. Gain some experience doing some volunteer work in the area and find out whether or not this thing you want to do will fit for you. A friend of mine told me he wanted to have a restaurant. I said, have you ever operated a restaurant before? He said, no. I said, well, really, you don't even know if you want one. I said, what's your expertise? What do you bring to the table? He said, I can cook real good. I said, well, what about the management side? What about the business part of the restaurant? You're not going to be cooking all the time. Somebody's got to receive the money. Who's going to manage the personnel? He said, you got a right. You got a point there. So this guy got a job in a restaurant in the evening time on a part-time basis. After doing that for a while, he said, you know what? I think I just want to be a chef. <laughs> he said, after working there, people didn't show up to work. He, he said, it's hard to find the help. People weren't responsible, the headaches, the guests were just giving him problems day in and day out. They weren't ever satisfied. He said, no, I just think I'll stick to cooking. <laughs> See, you got to find out what fits for you. Because you might decide that after you go up in there and examine it and experience it and, and get some experience under your belt on it, well, you say, this is really not what I want. This does not fit for me. So decide that you're going to do that. Now, John H. Johnson said something that's very important. He said, there's no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. See, whatever you decide to do, look at it and find out what is it that I have that I could bring to the table that can begin to enable me to ensure that I could be successful in this. Where is the opening for you? There's room for you out here. Out here in the arena called life, there's room for you to come out and live your dream. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner, or keep you up in the bleachers, looking at life being a spectator, not being a participant, making a difference in life. I believe that all of us came here with something. All of us showed up to give something, and that nobody, but nobody's going to give that service that you have to give. No one's going to produce your product. No one's going to write your book. No one's going to open your academy. No one's going to begin to create your daycare with a special curriculum to help to cultivate the high self-esteem in our children. That's your idea. And if you don't bring your idea out here, when you die, all of us will suffer because we've been deprived of your genius because you allowed but to keep you in the bleachers and not pursuing your greatness. You take it to your grave with you. And that's what most people do. I think that's why the guy said that many people die at age 21 and don't get buried until they're 65 got to have energy ladies and gentlemen you got to have life if you excited about what you're doing even in the area of selling you know people don't buy because of logical reasoning people buy because of your way of feeling
People don't like to be around dead people. No, no, let the dead bury the dead. No, no, keep them away from you before they grab you and run a hole on to you or something. <laughs> so the fact that, that whatever you do, you want to be excited about it. You want to have the kind of excitement that is so contagious that people want to be around you. Because whatever you're doing, whatever you talk to people about this particular idea that you have, they're looking at you and they want to know, do you believe it? And are you the kind of person they want to be in business with? And if you're not positive, if you're not energetic, if you're not fired up about it, how can you expect anybody else to be fired up about your idea? Am I right? All right, re repeat after me, please. I'm going to be fired up about my dream. I'm going to go at it with everything I got. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got what it takes. There are a lot of people who say, but I tried once or twice and it didn't work out. And so they use that as an excuse not to ever come out again. Guy said, um, if at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. <laughs> so, so, so if you have come out here with an idea and it didn't work out two or three times, well, that's all right. You're running about average. You know, I heard something, a, a, a jarring question. It says, why is it that people prefer known hells to unknown heavens? You know why? Because it's comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. I remember I was in um, a service once, and I heard Dr. Johnny Coleman give this example. She talked about a man who had been captured behind the enemy lines in a war and was sentenced to, to be killed or another option. The captain said to the guy, listen, he said, tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, you can face the firing squad or you can go out this door over here. And the guy said, what's out the door? He said, no one knows. All we can tell you is just unknown horrors. He thought, and the next morning he selected the firing squad. After the shots rang out, the captain's secretary said, what's beyond that door? And he said, freedom. But very few people would select to do it because it's unknown. See, a lot of people never live their dreams. A lot of people never do the things they want to do. A lot of people stay on jobs where they're miserable. I read an article called, Is Your Job Making You Sick? A lot of people, some of y'all know about that already here. <laughs> so go on and say amen, it's all right. <laughs> That one lady told me, she said, Les, I, when I used to go to work, she said, when I stepped in the door, it felt like a refrigerator dropped on my shoulders. How many of y'all understand that kind of feeling? <laughs> they were miserable, just hated to go after 60 minutes on Sunday afternoon. Or come Monday morning, my head used to thrive. I just couldn't take it. Didn't want to go sometime just, just for the heck of it. I just drive on by. <laughs> I, I used to hate to go to work. Many of us choose an active living death. Many of us are walking dead. The walking dead. That we're not doing what we want to do. Many of us stay in relationships where we're dying together rather than growing and expanding and living together. We're miserable, but because we don't have the courage to see ourselves beyond that relationship that has turned toxic. I'll never forget Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. What do you want to do with your life, young man? I said, sir, I want to be a disc jockey. He said, Mr. Brown. I said, yes, sir. He said, you got to be hungry. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. People that are hungry are willing to invest in themselves. People that are hungry will go to seminars and workshops. People that are hungry are always searching, always seeking higher ground. So how do you want to make it? I said, I want to be a disc jockey. He says, good. Here's what to do. He said, I want you to read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. He said, you don't get in life what you want. You get in life what you are. 
You must program yourself to success. He said, won't you listen to Earl Nightingale and Zig Ziglar? Listen, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. He said, I want you to change your relationships and I don't want you to ever lose your hunger. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are hungry are unstoppable. People that are hungry are no matter what people. They make it happen no matter what. He said, I want you to listen to Paul Harvey. Who is he? He's the world's greatest communicator. Success leaves clues, young man. Always listen and follow people who are doing what it is you want to do at the level you want to do it and learn from them. I told T. Hobb when we were standing by the stage, I said, hey man, I want to work more with you. I want you to coach me. I want to learn from you. See, I found you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. Always have a thirst for learning. So I listened to Paul Harvey every day on the radio. While in school, I would go out and listen in his car. He gave me his keys. I was working to develop myself. And I continued to listen to motivational messages. And he would take me to see the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. I toured with him before he passed. You, you have something special. You have greatness within you. Don't allow your circumstances to determine who you are. Don't allow your negative thoughts to hold you back. You, you have something special. You can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Dr. Peel was an incredible man. I, I admired him when he spoke. He gave me goosebumps. I can feel him in my heart. And, and I never forget, we were coming back to the school and Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. When Dr. Peel spoke, you didn't move. When he spoke, you were hanging on every word. When he spoke, we didn't have to tell you to sit down and be quiet. Why? I said, sir, I could, I could feel him when he talked. I felt like he was talking to me, sir. He said, he was. I said, but he doesn't know me, but he was speaking to you. Did you feel him in your heart? I said, yes, sir. He said, most people feel him in their head. If you felt him in your heart, he said, listen to him, son. Follow him, learn from him. And I would go to seminars and workshops. Anywhere I would find where Dr. Peel was, I would be in the audience. I would drive two and three hundred miles just to hear him speak. And my dream and vision was, was to share the stage with him. I thought about it. What is your goal? What is your vision? I want you to hold it in mind. There's some power in that. Because when I became involved in speaking, i never forget, I got a call from Og Mandino, who wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. He said, Lass, I'm stuck in Philadelphia. I need to be in Kankakee. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is appearing. I can't make it. I heard you're in Chicago. I said, yes, I am. Can you go and open for me? I said, yes, man. Oh, my God. Dr. Peale, I said, yes, I'd love to do it. And I went there, and I came. I said, hi, I'm... I'm Les Brown. He said, you're not the band of renown? I said, no, I'm, I'm Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. I'm here to speak. He said, come backstage. And his wife, Martha, was there. And she said, Papa, Les Brown is here, the speaker. And he said, Les Brown? Les Brown, shoot for the moon? Because even if you miss your land among the stars? I said, sir, that's my quote. I wrote you when I was in the 11th grade. I was a part of a special, special education class project. That's my quote. He said, I know. I end all my speeches with that quote. So I did the things that Mr. Washington suggested. I listened to motivational tapes on a regular basis. I would go to seminars and workshops whenever Zig Ziglar and Dr. Dennis Waitley and Jim Rohn would come to town. And I said, sir, I said, what do you want me to do now? He said, Mr. Brown, I've given you everything that I can give you. He said, develop your mind, put your money where your mouth is, continue to learn how to be an effective communicator, because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. And always surround yourself with OQP, only quality people. So I went to apply for a job on Miami Beach. WMBM radio station, Milton Butterball Smith was the program director. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, young man, you have any journalism in your background? I said, oh, no, sir, I don't. You have any experience in broadcasting? I said, no, sir, but I practice all the time, sir. Let me audition for you, sir. Let me show you how good I am. All I need is a shot, sir. 
He says, no, we don't have any job for you. How many ever been rejected? Raise your hands, please. I was devastated. I went back and I told Mr. Washington, I said, Mr. Washington, they said no. He said, don't take it personally. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you got to be hungry. Make no your vitamin. Go back again. I said, yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. Young man, weren't you here yesterday? Yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? Yes, sir, you did. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I didn't know whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. Nobody was laid off or fired. Now, get on out of here. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? Yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? Yes, sir, you did. Why are you back? Oh, sir, I didn't, I didn't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off a fire. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day talking loud, looking happy like I was seeing him for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He says, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> My favorite book says, the greatest among you will be your servant. How many of you are serious about your goals and dreams? Raise your hands. Very good. Write this down. Provide more service than you get paid for. Provide more service than you get paid for. I go to a lot of seminars and workshops. And one of the things I know about T. Hob Eckert, and when I was sitting in the class with Robert Rupel and all of the other presenters, they hold themselves to high standards and they provide more information than anybody else in the industry, bar none. They hold nothing back because their commitment is for your success. And when you hold yourself to high standards, write this down, impact drives income. That's why you're here. Because the training, the seminars, been making a difference in your life. If they did not have impact, two or three hundred people would be here, if that amount. Impact drives income. So I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I would go get their lunch and their dinner, and I would bring it to them in the control room, and I'd watch them working the control boards, knowing my time will come. Write this down. I expect to reach my goal. Yes, you want to operate with a spirit of expectation. I expect to reach my goal. So I started preparing for the next position. Never forget one quote that I heard. As you look at your life, you look at your goals and dreams. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. If you expect to reach your goal, prepare yourself now.